I saw a dog man using an aqua blue flip phone. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I went camping with my wife in a place that her grandfather used to tell her was sacred. I saw something there that utterly blew my mind, but it wasn't anything that I would normally associate with the word sacred. I saw what appeared to me to be a dogman, and it seemed to me to be using a cell phone. Not only that, but an outdated flip phone that seemed almost too small for it to hold. My wife has a different theory about what I saw, and I will get to that. But first let me explain how this all came to pass. I married a woman we can call Martha, and she grew up in and around the Hannibal Indian community in Michigan. She took me back to meet her family after we got married, and I was greeted with a mix of warmth and indifference when we reached the location. Some people were insulted that she married before introducing me to them, while others meant their indifference as a sort of automatic acceptance of anyone that Martha said was okay. The warmest member of the family to me was Martha's younger sister, who I found surprisingly flirtatious. In fact, her warmth got Martha hot, under the collar that is. And she took me camping in part to get me away from her very pretty and well-spoken younger sibling. My wife and I drove a ways into the woods. I was behind the wheel, but I had no idea where I was going, just that it was the woods outside of the place that Martha grew up in. She told me when to turn and when to go straight, and I drove where she said to. When we got to the place, she told me where to set up the tent what direction it needed to face, and then she went and started gathering firewood. When she got back, I had finished the tent, and then we got a fire started together. So far, we'd worked mostly in silence, and we were a pretty good team, considering this was our first time camping together. As we ate, Martha started telling me stories about times her grandfather had taken her camping at this exact spot. I was finding it hard to focus on her stories, I just wanted to eat and then crash out. I suggested to my wife that I would be able to pay better attention to the stories if she told them to me over breakfast in the morning. If she kept going that night, I couldn't guarantee that I wasn't going to start snoring in the middle of her story and thereby accidentally insult her ancestors. That made her laugh, and she told me what she has repeated to me many times since then. The best time to listen to stories is at night. If you listen to a story during the day, you can usually understand it pretty well and love it. But if you fall asleep during a story, it can become a part of the core of you, like part of your soul. I'm not phrasing it as well as she does, but that's the general meaning, minus some of her natural poetry. If we have children, I hope they inherit their mother's grace and not my brutishness. They're guaranteed to inherit a straightforward nature. In either case. So no matter what Martha says about those stories becoming part of me, I don't remember a word of any of them. And each time she would refer to the stories again all weekend, I would pretend that I knew what the heck she was talking about. I knew if I asked her to retell the story, it would only make her unhappy. She'd announced beforehand that I would understand the stories if I were sleepy, so if I said I didn't, then I would be deliberately starting a fight. I knew that much about her before we were even married. That day, I coaxed Martha to tell me more stories about her grandfather. She did, but they made little sense to me since I had slept through her first batch of stories. Still, I love to hear her talk. This was the year before the pandemic, so what was that, four years ago? But I still feel excited to hear her voice even all these years later. That night was the night when I saw the dogman, which apparently my wife had warned me about, you know, during the night when I told her I was falling asleep. So possibly my deep subconscious had been warned that there were dog-headed bipedal entities in the area. I'm going to use the general term dogman, but Martha insists they were something else, and I'll get back to that. I had to do number one. And it was two in the morning on our third night out there. 
I snuck out of the tent, being quiet so I didn't wake Martha, and I did a little two-step to get to the woods before I went where I was. The night was colder than I'd expected, and suddenly I felt the need to go ten times more than one minute earlier. That part of this narrative has a happy ending, as I did not wet myself, but I did dampen the sight of a tree in that dark night. I watched the mist rise off the tree trunk, and I felt a huge sense of relief. I had gotten somewhat used to the temperature while standing there, and it felt awesome to be right there where I was, so different from the bathroom at home, other than the spiders. I decided to enjoy a few seconds of the night, listening to the chirping insects, and whatever those other weird sounds were, that mixed in every so often. I heard something electronic. Someone was operating some kind of a device. I reoriented myself to face our tent, and I heard it again, but not from in front of me. From my left, it was a quiet little beeping sound, like possibly from a cell phone or other handheld device. I wondered who would be operating a device in the middle of the woods at 2 a.m. This was not an official campground, so I also wondered if we were in trouble. Might that be police or forest rangers coming to kick us out? Might it be bad guys coming to rob us? Or worse, I suddenly felt like I'd better creep over there and lay my eyeballs on whoever that was so I could figure out if their presence meant anything to me and my woman, either good, bad, or indifferent. I'm a bit clumsy in the wild, but at least I know this. So I made a point of moving slowly, carefully, and quietly toward the spot that I was guessing the sounds were originating from. When I would draw near, I would hear a little beep from a different direction, then I would alter course to follow my new lead. But I was not hearing anyone talking, so I began to assume I was only following one person, not a group. When I finally came upon my target, I almost fainted on the spot, because the thing I was looking at wasn't even a human being. It looked like some kind of a monkey with a dog face, but a very tall kind of monkey. Like what a Bigfoot might look like if that were real, but mixed with a dog. The legs that it stood on were like a dog's legs, I guess, or maybe a goat. I honestly couldn't see the feet. So they might have been clawed or they might have been cloven hooves for all I know. I did see the odd bend in the legs though. Odd for a human, that is. But common in hind legs for creatures such as goats, dogs, and cats. As interesting as seeing a bipedal creature standing on legs like that, though, it was nothing compared to what those legs supported. Because you see above them was a humanoid torso covered in thick animal fur with a canine type of head resting on wide humanoid shoulders. Well, let me first explain the creature's posture before I even finish the description. It was standing and leaning against a tree trunk as this started. And I was sort of sitting and leaning back against the same tree trunk by the time I decided I'd seen enough. I will include a drawing for you that I made so that you have the general idea. I am not that good at drawing. I got the body of the dogman okay in one picture and the trees okay in another. Then I pasted them together in an online Photoshop type website. It's not as nice as the work you do, but please show it for at least a little while so that people can understand my view of what I saw. Now, the creature didn't look like it was smiling like in this drawing. I was trying to show that it was sort of panting in that way that dogs do. It had its mouth pulled wide, so it looked like a smile, but I believe he was just panting. Again, my apologies for not really knowing how to draw very well. Now we get to what I guess is really the most important part of the sighting. He was carrying and appeared to be using a device that looked to me exactly like a cell phone. But not a modern cell phone, not a smartphone. This was like a flip phone 
from the earlier part of the century. It looked so tiny in his hand that I remained surprised that he could even hold it. I'll get back to the device, but that was another thing. This creature had what I would call monster hands. His fingers ended in claws. They didn't look like the hands of any animal I'd ever seen. Come to think of it, do animals even have hands? Well, I guess monkeys do. These hands looked way more dangerous than monkey hands, though. Those looked like they were made to hold things. This creature's hands looked like they were made to tear living beings apart. And yet, he handled the shiny blue flip-open device delicately. No, he wasn't speaking into it, but he would hold it in front of himself and stare into it for periods. Sometimes he would poke at the device, producing that beeping sound I was hearing earlier, then hold it up to the side of his face, and he looked like he was listening to something. I held my breath and strained to hear what he was hearing, but I couldn't notice anything at all. Maybe it was all in those high pitches that they say only dogs can hear. I was watching this for a while when I realized that my jaw was hanging open and I was drooling on myself. It was like I was watching a weird dream play out in front of me. But then I realized it wasn't a dream. All of a sudden, it was like I woke up to the situation, but I wasn't back in Kansas. I was still there, in the creepiest version of Oz I'd ever seen. I was just as scared of that apparent dogman noticing me as I was that I might be insane and imagining all of this. I decided to try to get back to the tent as quietly as I had gotten over to the dogman, and it honestly reminded me of trying to find my way home in the dark when I was drunk as a much younger person. I wasn't intoxicated on any substance at all that night, but the sheer strangeness of the situation itself seemed to create an alternate reality. When I got back into the tent, I saw that my hands were shaking, and that made me very unhappy and sad. I had been thinking that I was handling it like a pro, but instead, I was having a nervous attack. Martha sat up and helped me zip the tent closed again. She asked me what happened, and I felt so emotional that it was hard to talk. I kept sort of weeping then catching my breath and trying to speak. Martha held me lightly and said soothing words until we both heard a branch break outside the tent and we stopped speaking. We continued to hold on to each other for warmth, but our breathing became quiet and shallow as we listened outside for further noises. After a few minutes, I figured that whatever it was had gone away, and I was about to speak. Martha saw this and held her finger over my lips to keep me quiet a while longer. She started to point in different directions when she heard things. She would mouth words to me to tell me what she was hearing, but I don't read lips very well, and I wasn't hearing any of the sounds either. I don't doubt her at all, though, because... At one point, she hugged me tighter and pulled me down lower. And then seconds later, I heard a growl so deep coming from outside that tent. I would have thought there was a fully grown tiger out there lurking angrily. I mean, isn't a growl a threat? Why would any animal be growling out there? What would view us as a threat? I was about as scared as I've ever been. I couldn't ask Martha any of the questions going through my head, and I didn't know if the two of us were going to survive, whatever this encounter was that we were having. At this point, whatever that was out there began to make a sound which was significantly more canine, and I finally connected enough synapses in my brain to realize that this was that same creature which I had seen out there. Maybe he smelled my urine and followed me back. Maybe he could see that I had been spying on him. Maybe he knew more about what I had been doing that night than I could even tell my wife. And now he was doing this whining and complaining sound 
which was similar to something my dog had done when I was a kid. We would call it speaking in complete sentences when he'd go on and on, sounding like he was speaking his own language. With that dog, it was funny. When this creature we couldn't see outside of our tent did a similar thing, my shivering and shuddering got even worse. There was some weird sound that the animal kept repeating until Martha gasped. Then she said something in another language which had a similar cadence to that dog's sound outside. She said it again louder and the outside noise ceased. Then she shouted some other sentence which I also didn't understand and the animal outside howled. It was both a low-pitched sound and one loud enough to make my eardrums hurt. When the creature finished its long howl, Martha laid down and got comfortable for sleep again. I tried to ask her a question, and she shushed me. In the morning, I got shushed again any time I asked about what had happened the night before. I still hadn't even told my own wife what I'd seen, and that was frustrating to me. We ate breakfast talked about the weather. Then we packed up and got in the car, where I once again needed her directions to get back to the highway. But then, there, once on the highway, she asked me to describe to her exactly what I had seen in those woods. That was the original reason I made that drawing, or those two drawings that I stitched together. It was to show my wife that night after we got home. First, she laughed at my drawing, saying it looked like Yogi Bear, but... I am not a professional. Then, she insisted I include the drawing when I send this to you. So, I don't know, maybe she just wants everyone laughing at me. Anyway, she doesn't doubt what I saw, and she's convinced it was the same thing that came to our tent. She just says it wasn't a dogman, it was something else, which can sometimes look like a dogman. It was a kind of a wizard, or a shaman who I had interrupted when he was performing some very important magic or wizardry. I told her he wasn't doing magic, he was using an old flip phone. But she told me that I was only looking with my eyes, so I shouldn't be so trusting of what I saw. Maybe it was a dogman with an ancient cell phone, as I was saying. Or maybe it was a wizard, which I perceived as a dogman, through my limited senses. She told me that it was when she understood what he was saying that she understood that this was neither a normal canine nor a normal werewolf. It was an intelligent manipulator of consciousness and reality that my nervous system had reinterpreted into a dogman using a blue flip phone. Then when he howled at the end, that meant he was leaving but he was calling others in to guard us. This was why she didn't want me speaking about any of this until we were in the car on the highway. I don't know if I buy any of that, but if my wife asks you, tell her I completely agree with her. Honestly, I don't even understand if she's saying that the shaman chose to have me see him as a dog-headed werewolf, or if she's saying my own nervous system chose to interpret it that way. In any case, I guess I can accept that she's probably right and that it was more likely to have been some kind of shapeshifter or medicine man knowledgeable enough to have been able to cause me to see him in a different way than he actually looks. It's kind of interesting. I mean, if this is actually the case, then it's kind of like these shamans invented avatars long before video game designers did, you know? At least if I'm understanding my wife right. And I might not be. When I ask her direct questions about this, she answers with riddles. It's all very funny to her when I simply want to understand something she's told me. She says I'm very good at understanding complicated things, but very bad at understanding simple things that I see standing right in front of me. Like, what the heck does she mean by that? So I guess you probably know this already. But there is one more choice besides dogman or werewolf 
Maybe what you saw was either a different kind of shapeshifter or being powerful enough to confuse your senses into thinking that they are witnessing a werewolf or dogman. See, that part I understand, because that part is confusing. So, in other words, I can't tell you for sure if I was actually in the physical presence of a dogman or werewolf who was literally holding a genuine blue flip phone cell phone from the earlier part of the 20th century, but if you ask my eyes and my brain what they personally perceived as their experience, I believe they would request my mouth to answer you that. I saw a dogman using an aqua blue flip phone. If you want someone who utters truth and never spouts BS, she's our channel's own Babe Ruth, and we call her CS. Please join us in thanking CS for making this episode possible. She has made another of her life-saving donations using our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page, which only allows the coolest people in the world to send me direct and immediate donations. If you use it and the donation goes through, then there's your proof. You're clearly one of the coolest people on the planet. I've got some new merch coming out any day now, so this will be the last time we will air this ad for a particular item that no home should be without. And then our buddy Henry will come along to fill in the deets on how you can get more involved in the channel if you'd like to see us stay online. And now this. Got too many friends? Want fewer people knocking on your door? What you need is a Scary Stories brand unwelcome mat to place outside your residence or domicile. Our GUR model sends the message one way, while our nostalgic warning mat makes it clear the lengths you are willing to go to to avoid unwelcome interruptions from pesky humans and their ilk. The Dogman warning also comes in the form of a metal sign, which you can hang any place where you feel that people deserve to know the truth. Links to all three in the description of this video. Thanks, Biggie, and thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button or Join our PayPal Subscribers Club at PeterBernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 Lascari. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after I think three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Scary, scary stories. stories.